Good morning, Arcade Church. We are so glad you've joined us, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube. Take a minute, jump in the comments, say hello to a friend, let us know where you're watching from, and happy Easter. He is risen. All right, so what I want you to do is get up off the couch, stand up with your family, let's worship the Lord together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my sin Till I met you I was breathing but not Till I met you Oh, you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name You called my name And I ran out of that grave testimony I needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
worship you. I worship you.
walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to Yeah If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to morning, Arcade Church. Happy Easter. And you know what to say when I say He is risen. He is risen indeed. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning for our online service. Uh, we are praying that you are well, you are staying healthy, you are uh, staying sane in the midst of all of this. Um, we are continuing to pray for you and wanna know if there is a particular way we can be praying for you, please let us know in the comments below. Or if you have a particular request that's a little bit more private, feel free to head over to arcadechurch.com forward slash prayer. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you in a particular way. If today is your first time with us, welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us. If you'll do us a favor, text us Arcade Guest to 484848. We'd love to let you know how glad we are that you're joining us this morning. All right, next we're gonna head over to Pastor Dan Bryant and see how he's been loving his community and his neighbors in this time. Pastor Dan here and my wife Darlene, and we're here today to tell you about the Curbside Neighborhood Prayer Box. And uh, they asked me to share with you one of the prayer requests that came in. This one came in recently from one of our neighbors. It says, this is Joanna. I made this card for you. Thanks for the treats and your prayers. And thanks for letting me visit your yard and sometimes play hide and seek here. So uh, we got this idea in a staff meeting. Uh, Shelby Glass had mentioned how she and her husband Brian were going for walks during this shelter in place time. And they happened to pass by one of their neighbors who put out a prayer box. And I thought, aha, what a great idea. We can do that very same thing. So I came home and told Darlene, hey, let's make a neighborhood prayer box, but we'll call it curbside with the curbside pickups that we're seeing these days. So Darlene, would you share a little bit about how we put together the prayer box? 
So then we wanted to decide on what we could use that we already had and uh, put it out front for uh, prayers. So we started with a bird bath, old bird bath, and then I got a box that I had used for prayers at a prayer encounter previously. Put a slit in the top, Velcroed it into the bird bath, put a little flower out here, uh, water for the dogs, little milk bones for the dogs, candies for the kids, papers, and a description of uh, what people could do in order to leave their prayers. Oh, and we also put arcade pens. That was important. Just to reach out to your neighbors. I know we've met a lot of our neighbors since they've been walking and we've been walking, keeping our distance, but still extending the love and the mercy that the Lord has for each one of us. Well, thank you, Pastor Dan. I'm so encouraged to hear what you're doing in your community to love your neighbors. And I'm sure many of you are doing something similar as well. So please share with us, mention it in the comments below or send us a, men a mention at info at arcadechurch.com. All right, now I hope that you've been joining us and Pastor Craig for his day and night daily devotionals on Facebook and Instagram Live. Pastor Craig and a handful of our staff have been jumping on again, Facebook and Instagram, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. And what a fun time it's been to just be together in community, to exchange comments back and forth, have some laughs, meditate on scripture, and also hear some funny jokes from Pastor Craig once in a while. So if you don't wanna miss it, Please join us again tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. Speaking of staying connected online, we have some really special stuff going on just for our arcade kids and their families. Uh, we have resources available on our website, arcadechurch.com forward slash kids for you to have Sunday school at home with your family. On there, you'll find all kinds of things from the daily Bible study lesson video to uh, all kinds of YouTube playlists, worship, um, activity pages, all kinds of things that you can use from home. So after the sermon, hop on the Arcade Kids webpage and check it out. Have some Bible study, some Sunday school with your kids right from home. All right, so we're not meeting together in person, but there are still several ways that you can be giving to Arcade and her ministries. First of all, you can visit us on our website, arcadechurch.com forward slash give. You can hop onto our Arcade Church app on the Give tab. You can text the word Arcade to 77977, or you can mail a check or cash to the church office. Address is 3927 Marconi Avenue, Sacramento, 95821. Let's pray. Father, we know that you are the giver of all good things. We believe that you are sovereign, even in times like this where there's so much uncertainty. We are so grateful that you are our provider and in response to your provision, Lord, we are sacrificially and faithfully giving in this time. So we pray that, Lord, you will do what only you can do with these funds and thank you that you are good. May you find us faithful in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, well, it's so good to be together this morning on this Easter Sunday. Tell us how you're doing, tell us what you're up to in the comments below, and we'll see you online this week. First Corinthians 15, one through 20. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, 
though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of God. Good morning and happy Easter. Uh, I want to begin with something that the church has been responding to for well over a thousand years. When someone says Christ is risen, everybody else says he has risen indeed. And so here we go, okay? You're in your living room, you're in your kitchen, you're wherever, and you're, you're watching, you're listening to this. Here we go. Christ has risen. Perfect, I think. All right. So hey, welcome. Uh, welcome to the weirdest Easter service ever. Uh, for most of us who have been raised in church, this is the first time that we have ever not been on a church campus uh, for Easter, and yet we are still the church. Uh, we are still involved with this. Uh, the bad news is we, we can't be together, and that is bad news. Uh, even for introverts like me, it's bad news that I can't be with my church family physically. Uh, but the good news is that Jesus has risen. All right, it took you a little slower there, but that's all right. We'll, we'll get better as, as we progress. Um, the truth is, we don't know, we don't know um, what's going to happen. And that's probably what makes a lot of us, especially those of us who are control freaks, it causes us to lie awake at night because we just don't know what's going on. And, and the truth is, that can breed in us worry and fear and anxiety, maybe even depression, all the things that we work very, very hard to avoid in our life. We build up uh, mechanisms that we can be able to handle with fear and anxiety and worry, and then all of a sudden, because of COVID-19 and shelter in place, those things have, those mechanisms have been pulled away. And, and so now we are left with the very emotions that we work very hard to avoid. Well, there are a lot of things that we don't know about what's going on, but one thing we do know, Christ has risen. Yeah, now we're getting better, okay? He has risen indeed. Well, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the scripture reading that we had this morning, 1 Corinthians 15. And if you're new with us, uh, if, you're, if you've never been online with Arcade Church, uh, we're just going to go through uh, parts of 1 Corinthians 15, the scripture that was read earlier, and uh, learn some things from this and, and, and glean some things from this. We believe, just so you know, we believe that the resurrection is the most important event in all of human history. It's more important than the Declaration of Independence. It's more important than, um, than the Magna Carta. It's more important than anything else, more important than any aspect or any, any historical account that has ever happened in human history. I know that that sounds somewhat hyperbolic, that I'm embellishing here a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm serious uh, that this is the most important event. We look, at, we look at the crucifixion and the resurrection as being the same event. The crucifixion is simply God's victory over sin on our behalf. The very thing that weighs us down, the very thing that destroys us, God allowed himself to be destroyed so that we would not have to. He paid for our sins on the cross. But then the resurrection is God's victory, not over sin, but over death. Jesus entered into death, and he was dead for three days. And then he defeated that by his own power. And we believe that that same power lives in you and me. 
And so that's, that's, the, that, that's the resurrection. That's the gospel is Jesus died and Jesus rose. In fact, that's really what the scripture reading was about in 1 Corinthians 15. If you look at verse 3, for example, the apostle Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. First importance. There's nothing else more important. There's no second of importance. First importance is that Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ rode. That's, that's, that's the gospel right there. God giving us victory over our sin and God giving us victory over our ultimate enemy, death. And so we celebrate that. We, we look to that and we love that. And, but the truth is, probably a lot of people that may be watching this right now, you're looking at this and you're thinking, yeah, that's all fine, well and good, preacher. But the truth is the resurrection, the resurrection is just this pretty little lie that Christians tell. It's legend, it's myth, it's not historical fact. It's just a pretty little lie. It's pretty because it's quaint. It's sentimental. Who wouldn't want the founder of their faith to rise from the dead? That's why it's pretty. It's just, it's just nice. But as nice and as pretty as it is, it's still a lie, a lot of people think. Other people would say this. Well, it may, be, it may not be true. It may be fictional. It may be mythological. But, but when you believe in it, it still makes you a better person. Uh, the people that believe in this mythical resurrection of Jesus, even though we file that away with Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and the Great Pumpkin, we still think, that, you know, it's, it still makes us better people to believe in the resurrection, even though it's not true. That's not us. In fact, that's not the Apostle Paul. In fact, one of the verses that I want to zero in uh, this morning on and look at is actually verse 19 where Paul basically states this. He says in verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, if in Christ we have hope only in this life, in other words, if he is dead and he's still dead, if we have hope in this dead hero called Jesus, we are of all people most to be pitied. If our, if our hope, if we say that Jesus is alive but we really know he's not, it's just a way to give us encouragement if, and make us better people, make us decent human beings. If, if that's all that this is, then we of all people now, here today, we are to be most pitied. Because the reality the factual historicity of the resurrection is what defines us. And if that is not true, then we need to be redefined in life and in death. And so what I'd like to do this morning in the time that we have is just talk about the physical resurrection of Jesus and how this also points to a spiritual resurrection. And my hope is that you receive incredible hope because this is, this is a message for believers, for those who are not believers. Maybe you have been, uh, you, you've left the church or in your mind you've left the faith because this, just, this stuff just isn't real to you. Uh, maybe you're riding the fence. You're just thinking, I could go either way. I don't know. I, 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 there, there's something I'm hoping and praying for all of us in this message this morning from 1 Corinthians 15. So what does a life look like? What does a life look like that believes, that's driven by the resurrection of Jesus? What does that life look like that's driven by the resurrection of Jesus? Well, first of all, it looks like a physical resurrection. And then number two, it will look like a spiritual resurrection. And this is very, very significant. The Bible teaches us that there are two parts to every human being, body and soul. And both of these parts, body and soul, are of equal importance. And the reason why they're of equal importance is because God created them both. And he created them both as good. A lot of people think that the body is not good. It's the soul that matters. Well, no, the body is good. That's why when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are talking 
about the physical resurrection. That his body hung on the cross, a real life body that bled and died. And that on Sunday, the first day of the week, that same body physically, not just spiritually, physically rose from the grave. And so when you get right down to it, what does a life look like that's driven by the resurrection? Well, number one, at the very least, when you boil it all down, is those who believe in the resurrection see death as a doorway, not as a destination. We see death as a doorway, not a destination. If anyone who has lost a loved one who is in Christ, you know exactly what I mean by this. If you're not a Christian and you went to the funeral of a Christian, then you know how weird it is because people don't seem to be grieving the way that other people grieve. Oh, there's tears. But there's also this this under the surface hope, this sense of joy, this sense of promise that goes into that. That is because of the physical resurrection. Listen to what Paul says in verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. All right, so if you don't believe in resurrection of the dead, then of course there is a body somewhere in Jerusalem, somewhere out there named Jesus that is still there. It's been there for 2,000 years. It will be there for 2,000 more years if the resurrection were not true. And if Christ, verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. All of this stuff that we're doing right now, if Jesus isn't alive, it's a wasted effort. Just go on YouTube or watch a Netflix thing because this is a waste of time if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. And so if we're saying that Jesus rose from the grave, but he didn't, we're even misrepresenting the creator himself. We're, we're saying things that the creator himself never wanted us to say. That's what Paul's saying. So he goes on, verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Take that faith, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, take that faith that you have. And when it was placed in Jesus, take it and place it somewhere else because that's that's a wasted faith. And by the way, if you are not a Christian or if you're a former Christian, you still have faith. You didn't walk away from the faith, you just shifted faith. You moved your faith from this to that. And so Paul is saying, if Jesus is dead, take that faith that you had in Jesus and put it to use. Put it someplace else where faith can be useful. Because either way, you're going to have faith. You're going to place your trust into something or someone. And if Jesus is still dead, by all means, don't place it in Jesus. Because he's dead if there is no resurrection. Verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So every funeral, if Jesus is dead, every funeral that we go to from here on out, we need to weep and weep loudly because there is zero hope, zero help for anything. Well, I fully aware of the fact that there are people who are online with us right now who do not believe in the resurrection. Uh, You think it's a hoax, you think it's legend, you think it's mythological. Uh, It's not true, It's it's just a pretty little lie. Well, may I just say this, if, if that's you, the burden of proof is on you. Because the Bible responds to every possible accusation against the resurrection that you could ever think of or that I could ever think of. And so the Bible is saying it is true, and here's the proof. And if you don't believe the resurrection, then you need to devote your time to proving that it's not true by refuting all of the claims that I'm going to make here in the next five minutes. We're going to go quickly through this. I know that there are men and women who have written books about all of this, and I'm going to take five, maybe six minutes to go through this. And I'm hoping that this may pique your curiosity, that if you really want to prove the resurrection faults, knock yourself out. Go ahead and do that. Well, here's some things. 
consider the evidence that I, I, that I think can't be ignored. First of, all, first of all, we can't ignore the empty tomb. You just can't. And the reason why we can't ignore the empty tomb on Sunday is because both the enemies of Jesus and the friends of Jesus readily admit the tomb's empty. Read the Gospels. And you will see that the enemies of Jesus, Pilate, the Pharisees, and the friends of Jesus, the disciples, they readily admit that there is an empty tomb. So, if indeed Jesus did not rise from the grave and there's an empty tomb, it's because the opponents of Jesus took the body out of the tomb and hid it someplace because they too, according to the Gospels, they too had heard that Jesus would, had predicted he would rise from the grave on the third day. So if you were an opponent of the followers of Jesus, what would you do? On Friday, I would go in, take the body of Jesus, hide it someplace, and on Sunday, when all the disciples are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, I would say, yeah, no, here's the body. The guy is still dead. Proof. But they don't do that. They bribe some guards. They bribe some people. And they foster a lie because they can't produce the body. They don't know where the body's at. So, aha, it was the disciples that took the body. They're the ones. If you're a follower of Jesus, and Jesus told the disciples he was three times in the Gospels, he was going to die and he was going to rise again. And the disciples remembered that. And so, okay, here's what we got to do. We've got to sneak in there, overpower the Roman guards that are guarding the tomb, break the seal on the tomb, get in there, steal the body of Jesus, revive the Roman guards so that they don't remember anything. We get, you know, those, those men in black things where they don't have memory, and, and, that, and, and we make sure that they don't have any memory of what happened, and then we hide the body. Does that make sense? I'm thinking it doesn't. In addition to that, the disciples, at least 10 of them, died humiliating, excruciatingly painful deaths because of the cause of Christ, because of the gospel. If Jesus is dead and still dead, and the disciples knew that he was dead, and they knew that the gospel accounts were all nothing but a bunch of lies, would they have gone to the death promoting a lie? People die for lies, because they think that that lie is the truth. But would you die for something that you know to be a lie? The empty tomb, for those of you that don't believe in the resurrection, is problematic for you. That's a hump that you've got to get over if you're going to continue in your faith that the resurrection is not true. And it takes faith, as much faith to believe that the resurrection is not true as it does to believe that it is true. So what are you going to do about that empty tomb? And then also, another reason why we believe the resurrection is merely because of the eyewitnesses. There were people who saw Jesus alive. Paul mentions some of them in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 15. Look at those. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, the twelve disciples, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, probably referring to his half-brother James. Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, appeared also to me. The, the thing that throws me there is that Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. There were 500 of his followers that had gathered together and Jesus appeared to them post-resurrection, post-crucifixion, post-resurrection at the same time. And then Paul mentions these words, most of whom are still alive. At the time that he wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he's saying, Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time. Many of them are still alive, even though some of them have died. You can ask them. Those people had scattered throughout the known world. 
And those people had seen Jesus alive. Where is their testimony? Where is the documentation that, oh, it's just a lie. We really didn't see it. It was just a ghost or it was a stunt double. It was someone that looked like Jesus. It wasn't Jesus. No, Paul says, ask him. Ask them. Again, if you don't believe in the resurrection, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, the eyewitnesses are problematic. Here's another thing. We tend to minimize first century thought. We tend to look back 2,000 years ago and we say to the people back then, they were, they were a little naive. They were pre-science, pre-scientific. Uh, you know, they were kind of gullible, a little on the ignorant side. Of course, they believed in the resurrection. People that are naive and gullible and ignorant, they do. That's what they do. They believe in the resurrection. We, on the other hand, in the 21st century, we are post-scientific. And so we, we have weighed the evidence. We know this, that people don't come back from the dead. I think you need to think that again. Jesus was born and lived and died and rose at a time when there is incredible skepticism about any form of resurrection. Nobody believed it. Nobody. Take the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks and Romans believed that anything physical was seen as evil. It was just evil. Some Greeks, they would say the body is so evil that you have to punish it. You have to make sure that it's deprived. The Stoics would be that way. Other Greeks would say the body is so evil, just go ahead and have fun. Sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. Drink whatever you want to drink. Do whatever drugs you want because the body is evil. They were like the Epicureans. And so it's just evil. And so it's, it, it is unconscionable that anyone would ever think about leaving the body in death and then one to come back to the body. That is the dumbest thing we've ever heard. So would say the Romans and the Greeks. It's just, it's just ridiculous to think about that. Why would you want to leave something that is incessantly evil and then only come back to it? So Jesus died, he left his body, and then he comes back? I don't think so. The resurrection's ridiculous. I'm not gonna believe in that. So the Greeks and Romans... <laughs> They weren't going to believe in the resurrection. They were just as skeptical as maybe you are. But what about the Jews? Well, the Jews, they believed in resurrection, but it was a general resurrection, and it would be a resurrection of only the Jews, only the chosen people of God. There would be this general resurrection, but when you're telling me that a guy is claiming to be God in the flesh who dies and comes back to life, Not going to believe it. I don't believe in that kind of a resurrection. And so to say that the people back then were more naive, were more gullible, were more ignorant than we, and so they would be more readily involved in believing the resurrection is a ridiculous thought. In fact, they would be more skeptical philosophically and theologically about resurrection than you would be scientifically. So once again, I, I don't want to dare you about anything, but If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the burden of proof is on you because the Bible lays it out. And so you'll have to take, if you want to prove that the resurrection is not true, you'll have to take one each of those points and say, this is how it really was. This is how it really was. This is how it really was. I would just challenge you with that and just say this. That takes a lot of faith. That takes a lot of faith to not believe in something where all of the evidence seems to point to the fact that it's true. Death is a doorway to resurrection. Jesus went through that doorway. That's what death is to us. Death is inevitable for every one of us. And so when Jesus Christ died We thought that was the end. And then when Jesus Christ rose, we understood that to be the beginning. It is a doorway. And what's a doorway for? It's to go from one place to another. It's a passageway. That's all death is. It is a doorway. It is not a destination. It is not some place that you end up. 
but rather it is a door that you go through. And the resurrection gives us that assurance. It gives us that hope. And I don't know about you, but death is more real today than it was three months ago. Yeah, I look at the death count on COVID-19 and the number still keeps getting larger and larger and larger and exposure becomes more widespread. And so it's going to become very probable, very feasible that you and I will know people who not only have COVID-19, but they pass from it. They die. And the beauty of the gospel is this. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 11. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What Jesus is making is a bold claim that when death comes for you, when death comes for you, death will not get you. Oh, your body will stop breathing. Your heart will stop pumping. And your body will waste away for a season. But there will be this day when just as Jesus Christ rose from the grave, you and I and all who are in Christ will also rise physically from the grave. This is what matters to us. This This is meant to absolutely put a spring in our step even today that even though death is inevitable for all of us, we need not be afraid of it because we place our trust in one who went there and took on death on his own turf and beat it and killed it and came back to life. And so now Jesus says, you believe that I did that for you? I will do the same for you. Yes, that takes faith. Faith that is such a gift from God. What, what was it, you know, since this is, this is a time of pandemic, when you look at world history, you know that there were these kinds of pandemics uh, from the very beginning of time. Second century, sixth century, 12th through the 15th century, there were numerous plagues throughout Europe. Millions and millions of people died. Because they didn't know the cause and they didn't know the cure. Uh, The cause could be anything from flea-bearing rats to different unsanitary kinds of things. And what's unique is the people caught on quickly that plagues started and grew and destroyed life after life in the cities. And so what do you do? What do you do to avoid the plague? You get out of the city. Historians would say that there is this steady stream of people walking out of the city to get out of the city because they knew that that's where the place of death was. Didn't know why, but they knew that was the place of death. But then historians also talk about Christians staying in the city and other people coming into the city from the countryside. They were Christians too. And they would go in and they would, they would attend to the people that had been deserted by their parents, by their children, because they had to get out of the city. These people were left to die alone. Christians would stay or come into the city to take care of these people who were about ready to die from plagues. Well, what happened to the Christians? Well, this is the part where TV preachers say, not one of them died, not one of them. God allowed them to have victory over their disease. No, many of them, history says, they lay down right beside the people that that they tried to tend to, and they too died. What is going on? These Christians did not fear death because it was not a destination, it was a doorway. And they knew that death was simply a passage from this life to the next life that is far more beautiful, far greater. And so if it meant them dying, so be it. If it meant them living, so be it. Life and death no longer intimidated them because their faith was in the one who lived, who died, and now lives again. Christ is risen. Ah, you thought I forgot. I hope you mentioned that Christ is risen indeed. That's the physical resurrection. But then there's a second thing. There's a second thing for those that believe in resurrection and how it changes our life is that those who believe in the resurrection trust 
that change now is not just possible, it is inevitable. I I want you to resonate with that because Jesus is alive physically and spiritually. Change in your life, if you place your faith in the resurrection of Christ, change in your life is not just possible, it is inevitable. You will change because of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, Here we are, we're in shelter in place. You are in your home, and uh, I'm, I'm taping this in the middle of the week, and so I'm at home too, probably watching this. And here we are, and we've been in shelter in place pretty close to a month. And I would just say this, that whatever is wrong in your life is probably magnified. I'm, I'm chuckling about that only because I'm, I'm laughing with you, not at you. Whatever is wrong in your life, it's probably magnified. If there are things that are wrong in your marriage, then those things that you have managed to keep under wraps or to control because of shelter in place, because you are with each other for 24-7, those things that were wrong in your marriage have probably magnified and become larger. The issues that were difficult in raising your children are probably magnified. They're worse, possibly. It could be that there are life-dominating habits that dominate you, and those things are much larger. It could be that you have struggled with porn, and because you now have so much time on your hands and no one to hold you accountable for what you look at on your computer, it has just blown up and you are way out of control. It could be alcohol. What do you do when you're at home? and it's raining outside, and it's shelter in place, and you're not going anywhere, and there's nothing on Netflix, you drink. And that problem you can manage because you had a job. You could go away, and and you you, you could have kind of those props up that would shield you from being all out in those things. But now those props have been pulled away, and you find out that you your life is dominated by it. Could be for food. Uh, people joke about the COVID-15, that we all are going to gain 15 pounds because of being at home. And what do you do when you're bored? You eat. What do you do when you're watching TV? You eat. What do you do in, the, in between meals? You eat. And all of those things before COVID-19, all of those things we could control because we would go away to school or we'd go away to work and we would, we would do things that would be divergent from that. We would just take our attention away and, and they were, they were able, we were able to handle those things. My marriage is not the greatest, but at least I could go to work and be away from my spouse, be away from him or her, and, 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 and then come back and, and we can manage those things. But now because of shelter in place, All of a sudden, I have become strangely aware that I need to change and everybody else that I'm involved with needs to change too. And it's just become problems and the house is not big enough. doesn't matter how many square feet you have in your home. It's just not big enough to get away from everybody. And you're convinced that life is hopeless because... Once the shelter in place lifts and we go back to our, quote, normal lives, that problem will still be there and it will still be humongous. And you're convinced that we will never be able to change. And whenever I think of that, I think of what Paul says in verse 17. Look at verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You see, if Christ was not raised and Jesus is dead, then he really did not give us victory over sin. He was just a really good man who is now a dead hero. That's all he is. And if he is just a dead hero, even if he said, I'm dying for your sins, doesn't matter. He's dead. The payment didn't take It wasn't enough, and you and I are still left with those humongous things in our life that keep us from God. The cross 
is God's truth about your sin. The cross is what God thinks of your sin. Oh, I know. I've, I've, made, I've, I've made the same mental uh, 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 calisthenics myself. You know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I can control it. It's just my little picadillo. It's my little sin. It's not a big deal. And the way that we minimize our sins, we maximize other people's sins. Well, at least, at least it's not that. It's soft porn. It's not hard porn. Well, it's just a beer or a glass of wine. It's not hard liquor. We, we find ways to justify our own little sins. The cross does not allow us to do that because the cross is God's testimony. This is what I think of your sin. I hate it. I despise it so that I'm going to take my only begotten son, the son that I love dearly, and I'm going to offer him up to take on the ugliness of your sin. He is going to take the guilt. He is going to take the shame. He is going to take everything that I despise upon himself about you. Because I love you. And so God's truth of sin is seen in the gruesomeness of the cross of Jesus. And all that matters nothing if Jesus is still dead. And so the cross is God's truth about sin, but the resurrection is God's truth about life. The fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead from the physical death and spiritual death is so that you and I could have life through him and in him. That we would be in him and he in us. That's why Jesus talked about belief. When you believe in me, not just the facts about the death, burial, and resurrection, but when you believe that Jesus Christ took that upon himself to die for you and to rise for you, we take him into our lives by the power of his spirit, then all of a sudden we have new life. And this is the part where some of you might say, so what? What's the significance of that? Well, give me a few more minutes and I want to try to show you the significance. The Bible is concerned about days. For example, in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, he did this in days. There's a first day of creation, and then there's a seventh day. The first day of creation, God began this new work, this incredible work. He began the work of creation. And the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth day, he creates certain aspects of creation. The sixth day, he finished the work so that he rested on the seventh. In other words, he stopped working, and, and it's, it's all done. The sixth day, work was all done. So did you get that? The first day of creation, God began. The sixth day of creation, God finished. What day of the week did Jesus die on? They didn't call it Good Friday back then. What day of the week did Jesus die on? He died on the sixth day. And what was it that he said right when he died. It is finished. You see, because what happened between Genesis chapter 3 and that moment when Jesus died on the cross, sin had its way, but God entered into history and said, I'm going to reconcile the people back to me. I'm going to reconcile them, but I must do all the work. I started something in Genesis 1. I finished it in Genesis 6, or on the sixth day. I finished it. In Genesis 3, humanity ruined it. And so from Genesis 3 all the way to the crucifixion is the work of God. And so now when Jesus is hanging on the cross on the sixth day, it is ironic that God in the flesh in essence says, it's finished. It is finished. And so when did Jesus rise from the grave? John is very purposeful in telling us this. On the first day of the week. On the first day 
Jesus rose to new life. And it may be that today, Easter Sunday, is your first day. When all of a sudden, your soul and your spirit, or all of a sudden, your heart begins to beat for Christ. And there is this love for Christ that you did not see coming. Maybe you went online this morning and you were rock solid resolved to make sure and not believe whatever the preacher says. But right now, your mind is on fire. Your heart is beating. It's racing. Why is that? Could it be that Jesus has come to you today and he has said, live. Live. Come to life. Your soul has been dead and now I am calling it to come to life. Believe in me. And though your body wastes away, you will never die. And you will will change. You see, the beauty of the gospel is this. It is not you can change. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you will change. Change is inevitable. And let me just ask you this, and I know that many of us have tried different ways. How many leaves do you have to turn over before you realize you can't change? How many promises do you have to make to your spouse, to your boss, to your friends, Tomorrow's going to be different. I'm I'm going to be a different person. I'm never going to do that ever again. I'm going to be a different person tomorrow. How many times do we have to make those kinds of claims, those kinds of promises, before we realize all that does is just make us promise breakers? The truth is, you and I, in and of ourselves, we cannot change. I'm proof, and probably you're proof too. But the beauty of the resurrection is not just physical resurrection. It is spiritual resurrection. And Jesus has says, I am going to give you a new heart now that will take you through to eternity. And you will begin to see life from my perspective. You, you know who believes in this stuff? Addicts. Prodigal sons and daughters who have left home being so angry with their parents, despising their parents, only to squander their lives, and they come back with waiting for arms opened wide by mom and dad with no strings attached. Addicts who have been rock bottom, and they could not go any deeper, and the deeper they went, all they saw underneath them was Jesus reaching up to them. They understand what new life is. For those of us that have absolutely embarrassed ourselves publicly because we've bottomed out publicly and we have just done incredibly stupid things in our life that just absolutely mark us for life, we understand what new life looks like. We understand this because many of you that are watching and listening, you knew what it was like. There was a time when you were 30, 35, or 40, and you had lived a life, and you had hit rock bottom, and you didn't think there's any lower that you can go, and then all of a sudden, you heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and boom, new life happened. It was as if you came back to life, and it wasn't as if that's what happened. That is resurrection. It wasn't that, well, I pieced the evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. And then I, I surmised, I concluded that this was true, and therefore I placed my faith. No, is, oh my goodness, my mind is blown about the gospel of Christ. I can't believe it's true. I believe this. I believe it is true for me. That was the day that change did not just become possible, it became inevitable. But for resurrection to happen in your life and in my life, a death needs to take place. For Jesus to come back to life, he had to come back from somewhere. He came back from death. For resurrection to be true, the death had to be true as well. And so that's why it is so important for us to experience this kind of resurrection and to learn two things. And I'll go through these very quickly. Number one, we need to learn what it means to die to the world. I'll sum the world up in four points. The world wants you and me to pursue, doggedly so, four things. Money, sex, power, and fame. The big four. Money, sex, power, and fame. 
If you've got one of these, you're golden. You're, you're good. You, you can, you, the, the entire world is your oyster and you're fine. If you have all four of them, I mean, you're a God with a lowercase g. That, in our society, we lift up people that have at their disposal money, sex, power, and fame. We elevate those people. And those people are elevated and we say, I want to be that someday too. We die to that. Because we know that those four things, money, sex, power, and fame, those things produce one thing, death. That's all they do. Dead marriages, dead relationships, and yes, sometimes even dead bodies. That's what they produce. And so if the resurrection is to be true in our lives, young people, I want you to listen to me. You are being mentored, you are being coached to aim for the big four. Rebel against that. Just say, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to. I, I will not pursue those four things. I am going to die to my desires for those four things. And by the way, my desires are those four things too. I've just been around long enough to see and to experience that those four things, when I pursue those four things, it just produces death across the board. And they will produce death in you. And maybe that's why you've, you've gone online this morning is because you understand, yeah, I know what dead looks like because I have pursued all four of those things. And it may be that you've acquired all four of those things and you recognize that you're just as dead as before. And so for you and me to truly enjoy the resurrected life, to experience the kind of change that is inevitable, we need to die to the world. A death needs to take place. But then second, we need to learn what it means to die to self. And this is the hard part. Because again, our culture says, listen, you're all you've got. You've got to live for yourself. You've got, you've got, to, you've got to live for you. You've got to do, you, you've got to you do you. That's what you've got to do. And so you've got to live for yourself and, and rise up on your own. Can I just say that when you do that, death. Remember a couple weeks ago, a bunch of college students were on the beaches of Florida during this pandemic, this shelter in place. They didn't care. They didn't care. They were, they were out there. Well, we shouldn't be, it may have angered you, but it shouldn't have surprised you because they have been discipled in a culture that says no one can tell you what you can and can't do. And so if I want to go on the beach during a pandemic and swap germs with a bunch of people, that's my choice. I have my rights. No one can tell me. And you, you multiply that by 7 billion people in the world right now. You've got another kind of pandemic going on. You try to live for yourself and maintain your own individuality in the context of your marriage, your marriage is going to die Oh, you might stay married, but it will be dead. No, for us to truly enjoy the resurrected life, we have got to die to ourselves. And when that happens, that is when life begins. All of a sudden, you begin to look at situations and people differently. Circumstances may, may remain the same in your life. But all of a sudden, you begin to look at your spouse differently because you're seeing her or him through the eyes of Christ. And it's no longer, what would Jesus do? It's not, what would Jesus do? Because when we, look, when we look at what would Jesus do, we leave him on the outside and we leave him as this role model, as this example. Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise from the grave to be a role model or an example. He died on the cross and rose from the grave so that by his spirit he could live in you. And so it's not, what would, what would I do? It's what would Jesus and me do in my marriage? What would Jesus and me do in my job? What would Jesus and me in me do in my neighborhood? And when you begin to think that way, the resurrected life becomes true and you begin to live as if for the first time because you have taken what Jesus has done for you in the cross and the resurrection and you've taken it into your life because by the power of his spirit, so if you're a boss, 
You no longer look at your employees as people below you in the org chart. You look at them as people to which you you want them to succeed. You want them to thrive. If you manage people, you no longer look at them as employees. You You no longer look at yourself as a manager. You look at yourself as a mentor. That you want those people to live and to thrive and to succeed at their jobs. If you're a parent... In COVID-19, shelter in place, 2020, you no longer look at your kids as, oh my goodness, when's school going to start? When's this going to happen? I'm at the end of my rope. These kids are pulling my hair out. It's driving me crazy. But now, all of a sudden, when you see your children through the eyes and mind of Christ that is in you, you now see yourself as a discipler, and they are your disciples. They are your learners. That's what Christ can do for you now. He can give you life. Let me, let me tell you a story just in closing. I got this story out of a book by David Brooks entitled uh, Between Two Mountains. I was on New York Times bestseller, I think last year, a year before. He tells a story of a young man named Luke. Uh, he was a janitor, a, a custodian in a, in a hospital. His job was just to go down the floor and and make sure that the rooms were sterile and clean uh, when patients were in there and when they were not in there. That was his job. That was just go down this hallway. And he tells us, this Luke, he tells a story of a young man who got in a fight and was beaten so badly that he's in a coma. And uh, they weren't sure if he's going to make it out. And every day, the father would come into the room and just sit and be with his son, not knowing what's going to happen. And Luke would go in and clean the room while the father was there. And the father and Luke would strike up conversations. They got to know each other on a first name basis. And they got to appreciate each other's company. um, And uh, and just a, a regular friendship relationship. One day the father decides to go out of the room for a smoke. And while the father's out, Luke comes into the room to clean the room. And he cleans the room. He does what he does cleans the room, sterilizes it, then walks out and goes down to the next room, the next room, the next room. The father came back and didn't see Luke, and he was livid. He was ticked. And he went through the hallway looking for Luke. And he found Luke, and he absolutely just tore into him and just criticized him. You have not cleaned that room. And and Luke says, yeah, I did. You went out for a cigarette. I, I, I cleaned it. No, you didn't. You didn't clean that room. You get back there and you clean that room. My son needs to be in a clean room. And he was just really getting his face. And Luke tells a story. He says, a while back, I would have stood toe to toe with that man, arguing with him till I was blue in the face, that I had cleaned the room and getting angry at him because he was calling me a liar. But there is something inside of me that began to see the grief that this father was going through, not knowing if his son was going to come out of the coma or not knowing if he did come out that he would be able to handle life adequately. And it was racking him with grief and worry And I just happen to be the bullseye of that grief and that worry and that anger. And I realized that. And so I looked at the father and I told him, I says, you know what, I'm going to go back and clean the room. So he did. He went back, cleaned the room in front of the father. And he says, it's like a light switch went off and the anger went away in the father and they had a normal conversation. You see, that's what new life can do. The new life of Christ in us, it does things to us that we would never expect have happened. It does things in our marriage. The resurrected life does things in our parenting. The resurrected life does things in our neighborhood because we are there. The resurrected life does things in our, on our floor at our office because we are there and Christ is there. Because we are there, Christ is there. That is new life. Life And is it possible that Jesus Christ is calling you to new life right now? He's not here rubbing your nose in what you've done in the past or what's been done to you. He is here to tell you, I, I bore your shame. I took your sin. I paid the price. 
and I died. And it was a three-day project. And I rose from the grave, and I live. And just as I took your sin in my death, I now take your death in my life, and you will live forevermore. In fact, right now, live. Believe. Believe in Jesus Christ. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter how many empty promises you've made, no matter how many leaves you've tried to turn over, Jesus Christ can and will and stands ready to give you new life in him. It's my prayer that you believe. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the new life that you've given me in Christ. I'm absolutely blown away. We praise you, Lord God. We love you and we thank you for all that you've done. I look so forward to the day when we can be able to talk to you personally and to talk to those eyewitnesses who saw you alive after the resurrection. Until then, for me, Lord, there's no way that it couldn't be true. It is so true. It is so factual. It is so historical that Jesus Christ rose physically from the dead and now he lives in me simply because he's good and willing. I pray that that become true for the skeptic, for the non-believer, for the one that is just so resolved to not believe. I pray that you will break down their defenses, their obstacles, and allow them to see the truth of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love and for your truth. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, that together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome everyone in your living room in the name of Christ. And we all say together, for the glory of God. Have a great Easter. I love you. Well, what an incredible time worshiping the Lord together. And you know, our key church, I have a challenge for you. Our Easter dinner might look a little different, right? Maybe those around our table are fewer than what we normally have. Uh, maybe you're doing things different this year. But what we can do is share around the table your testimony of how Jesus has changed your life, what the resurrection means to you, what this new life in Christ is for you in your daily walk. So that's our challenge for you today. We love you. We can't wait till we're together again. We'll see you again.